Good morning. I'm Pastor Keith Spencer, and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church in Pembroke Pines Sunday morning worship. Our worship this morning is blessed to welcome our own Laura Mitchell, who will be sharing her reflection on the Ruth and Naomi story. We begin, as we have so often this fall, with music from Kevin Bates and then our Trinity worship team. God bless and thank you for joining us for our morning worship. I was wandering, I was wandering, wandering all my days from my father's house. From the heights to the depths, love was calling, love was calling, calling out to me just to bring me home. Lord of the earth and sea and sky In glory and power How can it be that I'm your child And you are my father So I, oh, oh I I will exalt your name again Most I, every way I can Put songs in my mouth. I am praising, I am praising, praising only you for the things you've done. There's a flag in my hand. I am waving, I am waving, waving it for you just to make smile many will see and hear and trust in you our salvation many will turn and seek your face from out of all nations and I oh, oh I I will exalt your name again most high, every way I can. So high, oh, oh high, I will exalt your name again. Most high, every way I can.
welcome here at TLC. Whatever color, nationality or race, whatever language, wherever you were born, whatever your immigration status, if you are three days old, 30 years old, or 103 years old, whatever your age, whatever your faith, or wherever you are on your faith journey, even if you've never stepped foot in a church before, if you are single, married, widowed, divorced, separated, or partnered, whatever your relationship status. If you are straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer, whatever your gender identity, whatever addictions, phobias, regrets, whatever burdens, whatever brokenness, if you are fully able, disabled, or of differing abilities, here we reject racism, misogyny, and homophobia. We reject the exploitation of all marginalized people. We reject using the Bible to abuse and want. We confess our complicity. We commit to lives to lives of repentance and reconciliation, of justice and mercy. To love God by loving our neighbor in both words and deeds. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Silence is kept for reflection. For our struggles to name you, our God who mothers us like a hen, as mother and sister, we are truly sorry. For the ways in which we have not honored the work of female apostles who spread the story of Jesus' unending love, we are truly sorry. For the times we have ignored women leaders in the church who preach, teach, and witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are truly sorry. For the violence the church has perpetuated against women, we are truly sorry. For our struggles to fully include LGBTQIA plus women in the work of the church who challenge us to more fully live into God's vision of radical, inclusive love, we are truly sorry. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ will live in our hearts through our faith. Amen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. For Eve, first witness to your creating work in the world. For Miriam, who witnessed your redemption of Israel at the Red Sea. For Rahab, who kept her wits about her and found a way to protect her family when invaders came. For Mary Magdalene, Mary of Clopas, and Mary Salome, who witnessed your ultimate redeeming act at the empty tomb. For Ruth and Naomi, whose sustenance of each other witnessed to your sustaining love. For Deborah, whose wisdom witnessed to acts of creation, redemption, and sustaining love. You have come to the aid of your servants. Help us to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant, who was in charge of the reapers, answered, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. 
So she came, and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Ruth 2, verses 1 through 23. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, behind someone who's in, in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep, keep close to my, to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have you why have i found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when i am a foreigner but boaz answered her all that i have done all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to the people that you did not know before May the Lord reward you for, for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley, nearly a bushel. She picked it up and came into town, and her, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out for herself to be satisfied and gave her mother-in-law what was left over. And her mother-in-law said, so much? Where in the world did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked. The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Good morning. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth, the Moabite, said, She even said to me, Stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Good morning everyone. Today we're going to talk about Ruth, Naomi, and Orpah, women of choice. The story is about women who made choices for their lives and relationships in the midst of loss, patriarchy, tragedy, and grace. When we think about women in choice in our modern era, we think about the debate to protect unborn life versus the right of women to make medical decisions for themselves. This debate, which has been central to our political conversations about women for about 50 years, while important, narrows the life experiences of women as well as the roots of the feminist and womanist movements. The experiences of women and the need for movements to address their needs has always been about creating a world in which women could be seen and experience the world as autonomous human beings able to take care of their needs and wants, regardless of their relationship to men. Only in recent history has that reality been possible on any wide scale. 
And yet, even now, there are forces that seek to limit the legal, spiritual, emotional, relational, mental, and physical autonomy of girls and women. In other words, there are efforts in place to restrict the lives of women and the choices they can make for themselves. In Ruth's era, with the exception of matrilineal societies where property was passed down through daughters, women were subject to the decisions and security of men. Property was rarely passed down to women. Political and religious decisions were usually made by men, and girls and women had very limited leeway as to how they could make lives for themselves apart from marriage or lives with their families of origin. As in today's time, these disparities were made even harsher in the face of poverty, being an outcast, being part of a racial or ethnic minority, and or being a woman or an orphan. Recognizing this backdrop, let's go back to our main characters, Ruth, Naomi, and Orpa. I've purposely chosen to include Orpa because her choice has something to teach us just as Ruth's and Naomi's do. Naomi had moved to Moab with her husband Elimelech and their sons Malon and Kilian. They were fleeing a famine that was taking place in their hometown of Bethlehem. They'd stayed long enough for their sons to take on wives, Ruth and Orpah. Unfortunately, while in Moab, Elimelech, Malon, and Kilian all died. Naomi now has no husband and no sons. Ruth and Orpah are both widows as well at this point. In a society that does not look out for women without husbands or sons. The normal course of action would have been to hope that another male relative would take mercy on them and take care of them or to become a beggar for your substance. For those who were skilled women, they could use their creations to become merchants for their own goods. Presented with these options, each of these women made different choices, all valid, and all with lessons for each of us as we weigh how to make decisions about our own lives. Naomi knows that in Jerusalem, she has a house, her husband's family, likely her own family as well, and has a familiar place to grieve. While she had been in Moab a while and likely had built connections, it just wasn't home. She was a stranger there. They had a different religion different customs, different ways of relating. Realizing she was going through a season of grief, bitterness, and heartache, she wanted to be home. She chose to take off on that journey. To me, Naomi represents our ability to look at our reality, what we have in our possession, and to make the best out of the worst situations. She knew she needed the familiar and the secure for this season of her life. There will be times we need our people. We need our familiar customers. We need our sense of home. Especially in times of tragedy and crisis, it is valid and stabilizing to go back to what has supported us in the past. Ruth represents the American spirit to me. Now, of course, I'm not talking about literally. Obviously, Ruth was not American. However, if you look at her story... It literally could have been written as the great American novel if she had been around during modern times. In the midst of tragedy, she takes off with her mother-in-law to land to a land she's never been to before to make a life with her. She gets there, takes on a low-income job, and through hard work and favor with the owner, she goes from being a foreigner to being the great-grandmother of future King David, as well as an ancestor of Jesus Christ himself. Literally, where is Hollywood when you need them? This is a story worth writing. But if that's all you see, you miss half of the story. Ruth's reasons for going with Naomi were just as important as the fact that she left. Her reasons are actually reasons that as an African-American woman, I actually can identify with. There are two concepts that are important to African-American women that show up in Ruth's reasoning. Those concepts are called fictive kin and sister circles or girlfriends. Fictive kin is the process of adopting non-related people 
to bring into your families and communities for the purpose of creating support. While there's a lot of evidence that this practice started in Africa prior to slavery, during and beyond slavery, it became crucial to helping black families to create and build strong bonds to con combat the trauma of brutal killings, harsh work and conditions and environments, and the separation of families. In the LGBTQIA communities, there's a similar concept called chosen families. And many individuals use it in order to create family in the midst of family and societal rejection. She knew Naomi needed her. And she knew she needed Naomi. Somehow Ruth understood that their destinies were tied together. The second concept of sister circles or girlfriends is very similar to being best friends, though it usually requires an intimacy that goes deeper. It's not romantic, but it does have within an expectation of loyalty that is rarely surpassed by other types of relationships. Many sister circles help raise each other's children. They help assist each other through relationship issues. They stand by one another through death, issues with the legal system, health issues, through wealth or poverty, through advancement or demotions. It takes a lot for these relationships to break apart, mainly because they're purposely designed to outlast every single other type of relationship with the exception of the relationship with God. Ruth teaches us that it is okay to make big decisions based on love and loyalty. Her story teaches us that the impact that relationships have on our lives and on our destinies is immeasurable. Lastly, we have Orpa. Orpa is the woman most left out and misunderstood in this story. In the many sermons I've heard taught about Ruth, Orpa either gets overlooked, she's a footnote, or she's interpreted as having made the wrong choice. I even heard one preacher claim if Orpah had gone with Naomi, this could have been the book of Orpah instead of the book of Ruth. <laughs> As Naomi's daughter-in-law, Orpah felt a loyalty to Naomi, resulting in her starting the journey with them. At some point, she changes her mind and decides to go back to Moab to be with her people. When Naomi insists that they go back, Orpah acquiesces after crying and saying goodbye. She left the two women she'd most identified with to go back home. We've already learned from Naomi that going back home is a valid choice, so that's not the issue. What Orpah teaches us is that it's okay to reassess, take in more information, and change our minds. It is okay and we are allowed to change our minds. This world tries to pressure us to have it all together and know our path all at once, but that's unrealistic. I can't tell you the number of young people who I've counseled, especially young women, who feel the pressure to know every single detail of their lives by 19 and 20 years old. Likewise, I know of many 50, 60, 70, year olds and even older who feel the need to stick with the decisions, beliefs, regrets, and heartaches that no longer work for them because they made them in the past. If you've learned more, if you've grown, if life circumstances have changed, it is okay to change your minds. The relationships between these three women pull them through the most trying season of their lives that we're aware of. However, for those of us women seeking to navigate our modern world and circumstances, the choices these women made with far less options than we have are guides for us in making our own choices throughout our lives. I pray that this time um, has blessed you and that you will reflect more on the lives of Ruth, Naomi, and Orpah and how their lives can help influence your life. Thank you for this time.
gratitude. I have so much gratitude that I want to share it with everybody. I have gratitude for everything that's all around me. It's a marvelous feeling and I want to share it with all of you. Gratitude. May we be a mirror of good health to each other and everyone. Gratitude. Hi Trinity family members, Jonah and I wanted to share some beautiful moments we feel we got with God this week in the into last from last week, him sending us some messages, blessings in disguise and and his connections. So it started earlier in the week when Jonah was finishing up in the bathroom and he came to tell me something very special. Jonah, what what happened, darling? That God talked to me and he said that I'll guide you through life, and I said, thank you. And then I said that I'll donate all my money to climate change when I die. And when and I said, thank you, and then he just went. Yes, and so it was a beautiful, touching moment that Jonah felt his connection from God. And then Saturday night, we were around the table having dinner with some friends we hadn't seen for a while. And we were reminiscing about Uncle Tom, a good family friend, and how he had the best bread, right, Jonah? Yeah. We were talking about how we love his bread and we miss it, and we haven't been able to see them because of COVID, of course, um, which we've been calling. Then the next morning, the coincidence happened where we got a message that Uncle Tom was gravely ill with COVID. We didn't realize in the last two weeks he had been suffering and we had just been thinking of him the night before just out of coincidence randomly so i feel that tom was communicating with us uh, because later that afternoon he did pass away and it was very sad for us last week and to be part of his virtual memorial as well but jonah used that as a time to do what you went back and talk to God as well about what had just happened because we were very upset too and shocked but in God's way his grace came to us and was sending us messages and had a beautiful conversation with Jonah so we're very grateful right Jonah yeah amen eternal spirit earth maker pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings. 
Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, we come before you today, and we thank you for everything you give us. Lord, we also keep in prayer those who need prayer. We pray for the world and our countries and our country and our leaders, our president. We pray for our pastors, Lord. We pray also for the children and families of El Centro, Carl, who is traveling. We pray for Mickey, Ann, and Sandra T., We pray for Ashley and Ryan, all teachers, students, and school workers. We pray for the Wingard and Bailey families, for Deborah Stewart, John and Kelly and families, for the Balmo family. We pray for Sharon and Floyd, Bev, Marshall, and Claire and families. We pray for Sylvia and her mom, families who are have pending medical tests, results, and procedures. The dependent family on the death of a loved one. For Patrick and his four children as they grieve the loss of their wife's mother who died from colon cancer. For Ginger's uncle Edwin with stage 4 brain cancer. For Whitney's uncle Howard. The families We lift up Claire and her sister, Jean, as she's in the hospital, for Sid, who has cancer, and his caregiver, Sandy, for the family and friends of Gina and Dave McKenzie, for Max, we pray for the Newton family, June, who is doing chemotherapy for breast cancer, we pray for John Walker's grandson. For Rick and Carlene's grandson, Jim. For Juan, who has accepted a job with Google and is headed to California. We pray for John, who will be heading back to Clark University in Atlanta. We pray for Diane, who had surgery. Prayers for healing and strength. For the Green family and the loss of their son and brother. We pray for Nikki Lawrence for healing. For Diane Nichols, Sydney, David and Janet, healing for Christine. We pray for Kathy in recovery, all who are feeling isolated. We pray for Bill, Edwin, Miss Bev, Selena, Scott, Carol, Mickey, Jenna, Diane. We pray for Richard and Devika, Andre and Nandita. We pray for Betty, Bernadette and family. Miss Margie, the Sandra Corbett family, the Steve and family, Claire and friends. We pray for Mark, Maya, and Olivia, Denise Salisbury. We lift up Robert and Diane, the Johnny, Grant Sr. and family, the Payne family, Cooper and Hills families, and the Hayes family. Lord, we lift up the Stewart and Slogger and Gibson families for neighbors, friends, and co-workers. And we pray for our faith family. For the Gucci, Gerhardt, and Noonan families. For the O'Neill and Luciano families. We pray for the Dawson and Schaefer families. And for the Munson and Cozier families. We pray for Diane and family. Dottie and family. Sally and Skeeter. Anne and family. We lift up Sharon, Donna, Matt and Nicole, Amanda and Drew, Elizabeth and Kayla. We pray for Cruz and Everett, Ava and Miles, Pickles, Odie and Bella. Lord, we lift up Carrie and Patrick, 
Lisa, Danny, Keely, Gail. We lift up Karen, Terry, Dawn, Ray, and Mac. Lord, we pray for Rodney and Carol. And Lord, we pray for all of those who don't have someone to pray for them. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace, the peace of, of the, the Lord, Lord be with, with you. you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The, the peace of the Lord be with you. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace, love God, and love all. Thanks be to God. And let the people all say, Amen.